Good evening, everyone, those of you who are present. Good evening. All right, I show uh, about 16, 17 of you, and uh, I think more will be joining, but uh, let's start on time. And um, I greet you here during the final uh, week of our course uh, leading up to our final exam. Um, this is being recorded, so uh, my comments I, I can uh, make rapidly, um, and then we can go from there. Uh, first of all, I have um, adjusted the uh, scoring of the midterm examination. Um, so what you see in your grade book um, will be your score on that. Um, secondly, tonight I propose to go over the material that we've covered since the last Zoom session. Um, that will be the funeral, the memorial services, and uh, prayer as the, the personal ascesis of prayer. <clears throat> I'll fly over that. You already have the lectures, of course, so I'm not going to re-lecture. I just want to touch upon a few points. And of course, the um, bulk of what I hope you'll find useful are the discussions over uh, questions that you raise. So in order to facilitate that, when I get to that point, I'll mention each unit um, of study that we undertook this semester. And then any questions you have on that, please present them. Um, matrimony, imposition of hands, confession, prayer oil, funeral, and the ascesis of prayer that constitutes our study on the sanctification of life, second half of the semester. So as you know, over the course of, these, of this um, two year, unit one and unit three of liturgical theology, we've looked in the first unit on um, the initiating sacraments, um, baptism, chrismation and Eucharist, the Holy uh, Divine Liturgy, but I did it in the reverse order in order to emphasize the centrality of the Divine Liturgy, the Eucharist. This is an important initial point to make because I have it on every exam. So that is the fundamental uh, character of this liturgical theology that I've been teaching is premised upon my central conviction that I believe is uh, borne out by the fathers of the church. That's where I got it from. And from the way in which the church theologizes, that is in the church services, the way we uh, proclaim in the hymns, the majesty of God and invoke his mercy, all of it is a proof that theology is liturgical and ritual in character. And liturgical and ritual action is the chief way the church theologizes. Um, dogmatic theology, that is the, the, the expression of dogma in the ecumenical creed itself, the symbol of faith, in the definition of Chalcedon and the fourth um, ecumenical synod, the um, triumph of orthodoxy and the uh, laudation of the proper veneration of icons. All of this is an expression of our worship. It is dependent upon how we worship and pray. It is what the uh, old Latin formula is, um, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is dependent on the law of faith and vice versa. That's a reversible predication. You can say it either way. How I pray is how I believe, and how I believe is how I pray. And this is what the church perfects. This is universal, both East and West. I can say it in Latin, I can say it in Greek, it doesn't matter. It is the central ethos of divine revelation. So I'm hoping that this study over the long haul, now a sustained reflection for you over two fall semesters in a row, 
um, I hope it's borne that out for you. I hope that has brought that home to you. Uh, Orthodox Catholic Christianity, that is the central tradition of Christianity that we've received from our fathers, expresses this in a myriad of, of ways. This particular semester, we've studied it in the uh, liturgical cycle of time, and we've seen it in the liturgical expression of the various mysteries of the church which sanctify our life from birth to the grave, from baptism or churching and baptism all the way up to the funeral service and the memorial services beyond. All of this expresses our faith in a ritual and liturgical uh, manner. That's why enthusiasts have so much trouble with theology because they're out of tune there's no possibility for them to properly dis, uh, to express themselves before God uh, because of their addiction to the physical pleasure of emotional flights. Uh, enthusiasm is a spiritual disease and it creates a chaos in the heart and life of those who are addicted to it. And uh, for sure, they're going to find themselves um, constantly chaotically moving from one uh, pursuit of experience to another. And whereas our orthodox way is timeless, it expresses it in culturally deeply stable ways using traditional forms of language, for example. Um, I was uh, at a deanery meeting today with some of the other clergymen and the discussion came up about the these and the thous in our, in our conversation. And the person who brought it up was in favor of, let's just say you, that's what people say. And I said, I'm, I understand your conviction and I understand your desire, your pastoral desire to, uh, to express things in clear ways. However, uh, the church has never done this. Um, in, in ancient times, uh, the synagogue kept with Hebrew and did not go to Aramaic. By the way, that's still true. Even to the very present day, the Jews, uh, they didn't speak Hebrew for, for thousands of years, ever since the Babylonian captivity, but they kept it in the synagogue all along. In the early church, uh, the um, Aramaic form of the uh, divine worship is still existing in those churches which are not in the Romeocini, you know, that under the Roman Empire, they still use Aramaic to this day. Uh, talk to any uh, non-Chalcedonian um, uh, Christian, you'll find that to be the case. Uh, the same thing is true in Greek. Uh, there were riots a hundred years ago in Greece when uh, there was a, pr a proposal, serious proposal made to translate the liturgy into neo linica into new Greek, what they've been speaking for the last, catch a hold of this, 500 years. The church has never accepted it, and the people don't want it, because they understand that when we talk to God, we cloak the mystery of the faith in many, many ways, not only with veils, not only with curtains, but also with language and with the icon. This is a, a fundamentally a profound uh, expression of, hmm, how can I put it? Um, humility combined with invitation. Like when I look at a curtain closed, I don't turn away from it. I get more curious about what's on the other side of it. When I hear language that I don't understand, I don't walk away. I say, what on earth is this language? I'll never forget the first time I heard the uh, liturgy of St. Basil the Great. And I heard the priest in... Uh, Thank God the priest did not keep it silent. He said the anaphora prayer out loud. I was so overwhelmed with the tremendous cataracts of 
uh, phrases that came breaking over my soul as he prayed the anaphora of St. Basil the Great, that I knew at once that I wanted to be Orthodox. I was still a Protestant. I was converted by listening to the anaphora of St. Basil the Great. I didn't understand most of what I heard. I did not, quote, understand most of what I heard, but I understood it at the depth, at the, pro the, the profound depths of my being. And this is what God is speaking to. And this is what our liturgical theology course has been promoting. Uh, God knows you've been struggling long and hard in this course with the difficulty of the material. And, um, but this ascetical endeavor that you're undertaking to work on this material is God blessed because it will yield the fruit over time of a more sensitive mm, theological conscious, consciousness. The, you might say the spiritual antennae of your soul will be more acutely tuned in uh, depending on whether you're continuing to pray and continuing to purify yourself in the fear of God, if giving those, given those uh, um, elements of human effort, as St. Nicholas Cavasilas calls them, uh, combined with the divine grace, it is for sure that you will be sensitive to uh, problems when they arise, either in a pastoral context or a catechetical, if, if you're a teaching or if you're preaching, um, or if you're just talking to some poor troubled soul and you hear their hearts cry within the midst of their words and you're able to give them some little you know, spiritual tidbit out of your life, properly disposed as the Psalms or as the Proverbs say, words fitly spoken are like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. This is, this is orthodoxy. We don't have to say much, but when we say something that's truly meaningful, that is a theologumenon that feeds people, then we've properly theologized because it's, it, it contributes to their salvation. There's a reason why uh, Protestants, especially evangelicals, like reading the gospel according to John because they feel the fruit of John's theology. He theologized. Luke reported. Now, I'm not casting anything down on Luke or Matthew and Mark, but John is unique in that he theologized. And the language of theology is ultimately very, very simple. Unless you be born of water and the spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. What could be simpler than that, right? So these introductory remarks I, I meant to offer in the way of uh, inspiring you, um, encouraging you in the ascetical endeavor that we've all been about these last three months, and to inspire you to go forward from here especially listening to the theologians of the church, especially listening to the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who are, of course, theologians, and, of course, St. Paul, right? And then, of course, all of the fathers of the church that follow in their stead uh, in uh, pro proclaiming the Magnalia Dei, the great deeds of God. Um, so. We have been looking now to focus our attention on this, this um, material that we're summing up tonight. We've been looking at the sanctification of life as it is uh, mysteriologically enacted through the various mysteries that mark out our life. Um, so as we said before, the, uh, the, the sacraments of initiation and the Eucharist are the foundation, and then all of the other mysteries of the church uh, stem from that in one way or the other. So let's start with this first point, namely that if, if we were to put all of this into one picture, uh, maybe in the form of the a center, a, foc a focus, 
and then all of the dependent elements, we could put the liturgy right in the middle, like the sun in the solar system, the Eucharist, and then all of the other mysteries of the church um, have, a, have a relationship, a center of gravity in the Eucharist, right? We've learned that, haven't we? We've seen how every sacrament is related to the Eucharist. It's related to the divine liturgy. We saw how the marriage follows the liturgy. Most of your papers, I just finished grading them all. Uh, almost all of your papers properly see that. And I, I think most of you properly also understood that uh, we don't have engagement in marriage. We have betrothal in marriage. Um, the engagement is a modern social convention, but that's a rabbit trail I don't need to go on right now. So the marriage follows the liturgy by definition. Uh, the imposition of hands occurs within the liturgy, depending on the rank of the person being ordained by definition. Holy confession is a personal sacrament to renew baptism. So it's really dependent on baptism. It has its unique connection there, but it predisposes a person to be properly fit to approach the holy mysteries in a state of purity again. Uh, I hesitate to say that confession is dependent on the liturgy because I think this is uh, somewhat of an overstatement. Um, unfortunately, many of the Slavic churches uh, require confession before every act of communion in the liturgy. Um, is my uh, sense here that by doing so, they're accepting a Jesuitical approach to the divine litur liturgy. And if you're a member of the Church of Russia or Rokor or something, uh, you can email me later and not raise your hand in this, uh, in this Zoom session because I, I don't wanna give my apologetic for that here. Uh, but uh, there is no, no doubt that the Jesuits had a profound influence on the uh, Slavic churches in the 17th and 18th centuries. And they left this as one, one part of it. Um, we saw the prayer oil, um, or the uh, sacrament of anointing for the sick is also dependent on the liturgy in that it has many elements that are liturgical in nature, uh, that show that it was actually practiced as an addendum to the divine liturgy. The, those who are sick came up and they were anointed with oil by the priests. Uh, we saw that in a developmental aspect of it. The funeral, um, which needs a little more attention. So some will say, well, in what sense is the funeral a sacrament? Well, in every sense. Um, let's get cured of scholasticism once and for all. There, where is it enshrined in scripture that there are only seven sacraments? Sure, that's a convenient number, but uh, as I hope to have shown through my teaching and through the readings that you've undertaken, it's not so simple a matter as a, of a mechanical adding up to seven, uh, neither more nor less. Uh, monastic tonsure can arguably be called a sacrament. Uh, the sanctification of the great blessing of the waters, even when there's no baptism takes place, that's a sacrament, isn't it? In other words, everything the church does is a sacrament. St. Ambrose the Great, who is the first to popularize the word sacrament, and his spiritual son Augustine of Hippo followed uh, in doing so, they use the word sacrament for almost everything. Uh, every action of the church was called sacramentum. So the scholastic uh, formula, formula of the sevenfold sacramental system um, has to be, I think, set over to the side a little bit. And uh, it's convenient, but it is not definitive. In the funeral, we have a relationship to the liturgy in that the funeral follows the liturgy. Normally, uh, the, the proper course for the uh, care for the dead is to bring the dead into the church, the body of the deceased, right before, uh, in the midst of the nave, with the feet facing the altar, 
uh, facing east, and uh, the funeral uh, mass or the divine liturgy is celebrated. In the West, it's called the Requiem, uh, Missa Requies. Um, in the East, it's just the divine liturgy. We don't have a special name for it. Um, and I should hasten to add here that if there's somebody who's died in the church or during the 40 days afterwards, there's actually a liturgical thing that we have lost sight of that should happen. For example, right after the priest enters the altar with the gospel, the deacon holding the gospel, the little entrance takes place. Uh, the chanters all sing the hymns of the day, right? You have the um, whatever the saint or feast of the day is, you have um, the, the hymn for the parish feast, the parish saint. Then you have the uh, contacium, uh, the seasonal contacium. But in between the parish hymn and the contacium, right in between, there's a special hymn ch uh, chanted for those who have departed. Uh, that hymn, uh, and there are special prayers, by the way, right after the gospel that are added into the fervent actinia. Uh, the Slavic churches have kept this tradition, kind of, if the, if the priest is uh, theologically uh, trained enough. Uh, we've lost it in the Greek and in the Antiochian church almost completely uh, because it's been forgotten. But it shows the connection of the liturgy to the dead. So we, we celebrate Holy Communion, communing in the presence of our beloved departed. Then we go to the funeral service and then we take the body out to be buried in the grave, right? So in all these cases, there's a, there's a expression of the liturgy being in the center and all the other elements circulate around that. But that doesn't mean that the Eucharist is the qualifying sacrament. So we must be clear about that. It's baptism that qualifies, chrism that seals, and the Eucharist that nourishes. And it's continuing. And so that's why all the sacraments of, for the sanctification of life are all centered around the Eucharist. But everything refers back to the portal, right? That qualifies one to participate. So from looking at the angle, not of the center now, but of the qualifying sacrament of baptism, one can see how all of the other sacraments of the church are properly uh, related to baptism, right? If you look at it from the terms of qualification, uh, for example, matrimony, it is not possible to celebrate matrimony without both persons having been baptized. Now this raises the question of mixed marriages. So in mixed marriages, uh, uh, which has a, a, a considerable uh, difficulty for us for now over a thousand years. Um, in other words, the, the married, the marriage of an Orthodox Christian with a heterodox Christian. I'm not talking about a marriage of an Orthodox Christian with a non-Christian. We're talking about that both, both have been properly baptized. In other words, we, uh, once we settle the question of whether a person can be received into the church by um, chrism or not, following the model of the second ecumenical synod in the fourth century. In other words, from that time on, the church has always made a discernment as to how to receive heterodox Christians. Should they be received uh, as though they had not been baptized, in which case they're not Christians? Or do we accept the baptism and then complete what's missing by uh, sealing them with sacred chrism after instruction? That same question approaches marriage. In other words, in the mixed marriage, we cannot consider the union of somebody who is not baptized with the Orthodox Christian. It's not possible. So the same rule would hold there. That's a nice way to see it. 
and it shows that baptism is a qualifying sacrament for marriage. Um, then we look at imposition of hands. Obviously, if the person's not baptized, they cannot be ordained. Uh, but we shouldn't hurry past this point because there's been cases in church history, very notable ones, where catechumens have been elected to the episcopate. In the case of um, the catechumen, um, I'm forgetting his name now. Let's just go to uh, the layman. Uh, Ambrose was a layman when he was elected as bishop. So was Tarasios of Constantinople. Uh, neither one was ordained to any rank and they were elected as bishops. Um, but there is cases where a catechumen has been elected and then they had to be baptized. And then of course, properly prepared from there. Now that's a very unique case because there is a scriptural uh, warning about not laying hands on anyone suddenly, uh, as St. Paul says to Timothy, uh, warning him not to ordain people uh, without proper preparation. So we must hasten to add that. But church history has lots of uh, things in it that upset the apple cart, and this would be one of them. Um, confession always presumes baptism, and this sometimes gets lost sight of uh, when uh, Priests who are very zealous uh, with converts invite them to confession. I do. I invite them to confession. But I do not, it's not a sacramental action. It's merely uh, preparatory to baptism. And I let them know that. I said, I'm not going to do anything formal here because we're preparing for your, uh, for your baptism. And when you're baptized, your sins are forgiven. It's baptism unto the forgiveness of sins. So, what better way to prepare for that than to admit your sins and your problems and look for the path of Christ, which is being presented to you? Well, after a person's been baptized, then of course the sacrament of penance, uh, repentance, confession, goes by all those names, uh, can be properly um, exercised as a renewal of the baptismal purity so you can see the dependence, right? Uh, we say in the one prayer, um, uh, and reconcile and unite them unto thy holy church through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word reconcile assumes that they were united to the church, but through sin uh, defiled the bond, uh, broke it, or severely injured it, so they need to be re restored. By the way, this little point here might help you with uh, being done once and for all with this idea of confession being tied to the Eucharist. Is it true that any sin I commit will sever my relationship with the church? David, I see your beautiful son. I love that. Um, Josiah. <laughs> Josiah, God bless him. Uh, is it true that any sin I do severs my relationship with Christ and his church? No, of course, it's not true at all. As a matter of fact, um, I can take you to a passage in St. Maximus, the confessor, where he says very clearly that when uh, a person sins in, in some um, not serious way, um, the divine grace does not depart, but God in his mercy stays and encourages through our conscience uh, that we uh, come to our senses and, and then go forward from there. Remember, the glory did not depart from the temple of God until the prophecy, uh, prophetic era of Ezekiel. That's after many centuries where the divine glory was present in the temple uh, and many generations of uh, faithlessness before God departed. You can see in the prayer oil that baptism is um, a prerequisite in that just before the oils uh, of anointing is given, the priest expresses to those gathered, if you're not an Orthodox Christian, um, please refrain from coming up and receiving the oil. This is a mysteriological oil and it presumes you're already an Orthodox Christian. Um, 
people have violated this over the years. And a few years ago, we had an Episcopal uh, directive regarding this under our previous Metropolitan in the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America, Metropolitan Philip. Um, that directive was very accurate, which he said, he, he said uh, no, uh, don't anoint people who are not Orthodox. Um, it's like receiving communion. This is the same level as receiving communion. And then um, uh, obviously the funeral service requires baptism as its qualifying sacrament. We do not do an Orthodox funeral for those who have not been baptized. There is one uh, exception, and I have personally done this once. Um, for those who have been uh, enrolled into the catechumenate, that is they wanted to be baptized, they have formally declare themselves candidates for baptism with the church instructing them. If they die before they receive the baptismal font, they are normally given an Orthodox funeral. I did this for a 17 year old boy once. It was a very moving experience for everybody involved. He had an Orthodox name, but he was not, he had never received Holy Communion, but he died in an automobile accident and we buried him as an Orthodox Christian. Quite a remarkable event. And then finally, uh, the ascesis of prayer. Um, this was the last lecture that you just listened to. And in it, um, I made the point that both charismatic and liturgical prayer are related to each other, right? And where does this charismatic and liturgical prayer come from? If not the church itself premised upon our baptism um, at the seal of the Holy Spirit that we're given in chrism, our prayer is inspired and we become competentes as the Latin calls it. In other words, those who are able to pray with the Holy community. Remember, um, uh, in the liturgy itself from last year, remember when we studied the um, rubric uh, during the um, prayers for the catechumens, the introductory rubric that the deacon intones is, or exclaims, he says, catechumens, present yourselves to the Lord. And uh, that's, that's my translation. Uh, Father Michel Najem and I translated it that way in our liturgical um, uh, translation uh, that will come out soon. Um, it's actually in publication now. Um, in that phrase, um, it says, Efxeste to Kirio. Make your vow to the Lord, or we said, present yourselves to the Lord in prayer. That has to come first. Then after that comes prosefskiste, or pray to the Lord. So the deacon says, present yourselves to the Lord, you catechumens. And then he immediately starts saying the petition, uh, the series of petitions in that prayer for the catechumens. Um, Ye faithful, let us pray for the catechumens. When he says that, he changes the word from efchome to prosefchome. And this is mentioned by none other than Gregory um, of Nyssa. In his commentary, he makes a very clear point about this very same thing, and he expresses it in his writings, uh, that the catechumens are not yet competent, but they will be made competent once they join the church. That presumed baptism. So I've given you the grand picture to tie everything together. Now, a couple of things on the final. Um, it will be presented to you uh, tomorrow, and you'll have until next Friday to complete it. Uh, this, the, this exam is the same structure as the midterm. There are 50 questions. Most of them are uh, multiple, one out of a multiple choice of three or four choices. I think I've edited them all down. There used to be five, but I don't think I have any left like that. I felt that was too much. So I tried to make them a little tighter, um, a little clearer that way. 
In other words, I'm not trying to trick you. Uh, my wife says, <laughs> my wife says to me, Father Patrick, you're just mean. Uh, you're, you're trying to trip them up. And, and I said, no, I just have a high bar right up here, I have a high bar. I want everybody to jump over. And she says, yeah, but maybe sometimes when many people flop on that bar, you should lower it just a little bit. And I said, okay, okay, I'll do that. Anyway, so I've edited that a little bit and you can thank my wife, Korea Christina. And whenever you think of this, you can, <laughs> you can say, thank God for Korea Christina. All right. She will, she will be remembered in my prayers this evening. <laughs> she's a, she's, she sounds like a former educator. She is. She's actually. I, I, I was in the classroom for 10 years. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, she, guess what? She was a special education teacher <laughs> at, at the um, middle, mm. like uh, the fourth, fifth, sixth grade level, that, that area in there. She loves ah, those. Yeah. So, and she was very effective. Um, and now uh, late in life, I'm profiting more from her. I think more because I'm able to calm down a little bit and uh, listen to the good advice she has. At any rate, you, you would do well to log into that uh, test early um, on Populi, go to the one that shows the exam, not the one where you put in your answers. Remember, we have the one which shows the exams. So you have enough time to really work your way through it. Take your time. Don't wait to the end of the week. Um, uh, mark up, like on a piece of pa paper or whatever, what your answers would be. Um, don't try to do it all in one sitting. If it's um, getting rough, you know, put it away and then come back to it. Uh, this is basic uh, test taking. Um, advice. Um, when I was teaching high school for many years, um, I taught my Latin and German students the same thing. I said, when you take a test, take your time, make sure that you've slept well the night before, get some rest, clear your agenda, concentrate on what you're doing. And then if you need a break, then take a little bit of a break. So um, this is, I think, very important. Um, so now I've talked enough. I've given you my introductory um, kind of big picture uh, framework. Now I would like to uh, take your questions and comments and let's do it a topic by topic. So we'll start with matrimony. Um, do you have any questions, comments, or um, issues regarding the sacrament of matrimony? that remain uh, important for you to bring up. Yes, Alejandro. Thank you, Father. I'm, my question is uh, related to matrimony and, and the Eucharist. Um, could you um, share with us the idea that, of course, the, the connection in the, in, in, in the sacrament is super important, um, but the continuation of receiving the Eucharist in the life of the, the couple throughout their life as a source of nourishment, not only individually, but for the, the couple together. Yes. Um, the first of all, this is the key issue in the issue of mixed marriages, because they're not able to take communion together. Uh, so exactly. I, I want to register that right off the bat. Um, it's also the reason yep. why in the common cup, we no longer have the pre-sanctified communion because of the uh, long time now we've had an experience of having to accommodate. Usually mixed marriages meant that an Orthodox Christian is marrying a Latin to use the old language. In other words, a yeah. Roman Catholic. Uh, after the separation of the Roman church from the uh, apostolic um, tradition of the, um, the plurality of the churches and the local, the, Ro the Roman church uh, went its way. And then how, how was there going to be um, um, 
an ad how would this be addressed? So that was addressed by, uh, I'm not saying that the Common Cup, this forced it to be this way, but it, it certainly contributed to it. There's no question about it because we know in the manuscript tradition that the Common Cup was pre-sanctified communion. We know that. I presented it in my lecture. So there's that element of the problem of mixed marriages. So setting that aside is a special pastoral issue. Then going back to marriage and the sharing of our, our life together on the rock of Christ in his body and blood is fundamental for a, um, a serious uh, Orthodox Christian life. Um, St. Paisius of Athos said, there's two things that make a marriage, um, uh, threatens a marriage. Uh, and if both of them are settled, then the, the possibility of the marriage being very well established is great. The shared faith and the absence of serious mental or psycho psychological illness. Um, if, the, if those two conditions are established, then the marriage has every um, chance of succeeding. Everything else can be handled. Um, I think more can be said, but um, obviously when a couple learns how to receive communion together, practice mutual forgiveness and humility, what could be a greater arena of salvation than that? Thank you, Father. Okay, anything else on marriage? Uh, yes, I have a question, Father. Yes, uh, Subdeacon Marwan. Um, I, I believe somewhere in the lecture note you said that uh, the crowning service is the lifting up of marriage to the kingdom of uh, God. Um, uh, I don't know that I said that it was a lifting up to the kingdom of God, but the crowning, as I understand it from the writings of the fathers, the crowning has a twofold purpose. It is the reward of um, the preservation of virginity and it is the um, uh, declaration that the husband and the wife um, are sovereigns in a new family. And that, that now that children that will come into the world, they, they have their little miniature government right there, their home, their domestic, um, uh, the establishment of a new family. Great. And, and of course, the symbolism, uh, using that word in its highest, highest meaning, um, mentioned by St. Paul, of showing the relationship of Christ to his church is expressed. But that's not what the crowns are expressing. The crowns are expressing sovereignty and also the reward of chastity. Thank you very much, Abuna. Yeah, okay. Uh, David. Yes, Father. Um, this is, I think it was in the marriage lecture. I can't remember if it was the marriage or imposition of hands, but I think you had a, a, a point about something being different when someone is ordained when they are married versus when they are not. And I don't just mean to the bishopric or something, but it seemed like there was something that happens in reference to that. Uh, maybe I'm completely off base and it's a non-issue, but... <laughs> Are you talking about the uh, mar are you talking about the ordination service then? Yes, but no. it's because of the something ordination here. service has no regard for the status of the person whether they're married or not. It's the same service. There's no there's no points where they change that changes. Okay, it's just okay. That makes sense. I think maybe then what I heard is you said the person is now married to the church is. Uh, oh, okay, and I wanted yes. to make sure that wasn't a link as a result. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because I did see in many of your papers this idea that the, that the ordination is a marriage to Christ or to his church. I don't think that's quite accurate, uh, to be honest with you. I think it's better to put it this way, um, that, uh, well, first of all, let's be clear, um, clergymen may not get married. Right. I mean, if you're if you're a deacon, a priest, or a bishop, you you may not get married. That's ruled out. However, if you're married and become a clergyman, then you're not supposed to leave your wife. 
this is the church uh, did not uh, prejudice marriage at the expense of the apostolic ministry, right? They're they're coordinated. We're clear about that, right? We have no uh, those who are unmarried. Um, I'm sorry, though, yeah, the clergymen that are unmarried are not higher than those who are married. That's really important to establish right off the base, off the bat. Okay, so once we've got that clear, that there's no prejudice for the married, uh, against the married, and that if in fact there were a prejudice, the person uh, expressing it is liable for deposition according to the canons of the church. Did you know that? Um, in the first ecumenical synod, when this question came up, um, I believe it was Abba Varsinufios um, who uh, brought up the question as a monk, a desert father, and said that he did not agree that uh, the non-married were in a special class. All right, so we're clear on that point. All right, so um, clergymen may not get married, but married men may become clergy, I guess is the point I would like to make there. So there's no difference in the performance of the sacrament of marriage, because if a person, I'm sorry, in the sacrament of ordination, uh, if the person being ordained is otherwise canonically approved, then we make no difference whether they're married or not. So what is then the result of the, of the ordination? Notice what happens. What do they kiss? What do they venerate when they're being ordained? I'll take anybody. The altar. The yeah. The altar. They the kiss altar. the holy <laughs> table, all four corners of it. And then after all four corners, they kiss the bishop's hand to show their obedience. So they're linked to the holy altar. If anything, the altar or the holy table becomes their mistress. I mean this word in this positive sense, of course, right? So the, uh, the, uh, the new deacon, the new priest, the new, the new bit, well, of course, the bishops by, uh, by long custom have not been married men. Uh, so we can leave that out for now. But the new bishop and the new... I'm sorry, the new deacon and the new presbyter, um, as married men, they were prepared by their bishop in interview with their wives as to whether they approved or not of this arrangement, because they'd be sharing their husbands for the rest of their life with the altar of God. No longer would the woman have the luxury of sitting with her husband on Sunday morning, watching football over a cup of coffee to put it bluntly. <laughs> no longer would the Korea have the luxury of going out for a dance with her husband at the local uh, nightclub, right? This is a different way of life. So I guess that's the point I'd like to make there. Uh, as for the unmarried, uh, of course, uh, once they are ordained, that closes the door for that. That's why usually with seminarians, even very highly competent ones, we wait to ordain them to make sure um, that they intend uh, like to give them the chance to get married. Uh, and uh, for those who definitely don't want to get married, we make sure that they're not um, falling off the rails somehow, or that psychologically they're not going through some problems that will uh, co-opt their success in uh, being representatives of Christ in uh, the, the ranks of the clergy later on in their life. There are so many pitfalls. So, uh, we don't, we don't seal the deal with the unmarried until we've given them a chance to really show that they're comfortable uh, remaining unmarried and they will never marry in their life. They'll be chaste uh, men who, who will then lead a way of life accordingly, uh, or they give them a chance to get married before they're ordained. Anything else on marriage? All right. Let's move on to imposition of hands. Notice that I don't call it ordination. Sure, ordination, fine. 
But ordination is a Latin word that means the uh, placing in the rank, the putting in order, ordinatio, uh, 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 like we say holy orders in the, in the Western tradition. Uh, there's nothing wrong with those words, but it is not um, expressive of how the sacrament actually works. If, so to call it ordination is simply, um, you might say a status, uh, the name of the status that's being um, given. Uh, you're now among the ranks of the deacons. You're now among the ranks of the priests, right? That uh, ordinez, ranks, okay? Uh, whereas in the Eastern tradition, the hierotonia um, emphasizes the Episcopal action or the sacramental action that's being done, namely the placing of the hand uh, or the imposition of the hands upon the ordinand to make the man either a deacon, a presbyter, or a bishop. All right, so imposition of hands. This covered a lot of material, this particular sacrament, and uh, I'm, I would be surprised if I didn't have several questions here. Lyle? Uh, yes, I actually had a conversation with my priest. I'm, I'm Western Rite, and he's relatively a uh, new convert okay. um, within the past two or three years. And uh, and he had an article in a paper where he uh, talked about ordination of our reader. And I, I had to say, say, I need to kind of get some clarification there because I go, that's being tonsured. A and what I think you talked about in the lecture, the difference between placement of the hands and ordination. That's why that word's kind of... Uh, right. A trigger word, as they say nowadays. Yes, because, of course. Right. Are the clergy are ordained in the Western Rite, but I just think for the from an Orthodox point of view that I love so much, I think the Western Rite needs to make sure we that that's very clear with the priests that that readers and subdeacons on down are tonsured because it's outside of the altar when that takes place. So from my understanding, listening to your lecture. So I just yeah. wanted to kind of your comment on that. You're, you're right. We don't use the word ordination for the installation, uh, the setting apart. I prefer the word setting apart or installation of readers um, and subdeacons. Uh, they, they remain laymen. They're not ordained. Um, and it's important that they know that so that they don't uh, get embarrassed uh, by doing something uh, outside of their uh, competence um, and thus, uh, you know, like causing a problem. Um, I don't even like the word tonsuring. Uh, strictly speaking, um, uh, readers and subdeacons are not tonsured. They're installed. The bishop places his hand on them and that's the end of the matter. Uh, outside of the altar, you, in the nave of the church, could be anywhere, it could make a reader, um, uh, you know, in any part of the church, but never in the holy place next to the holy table. Um, the lay, uh, the, the placement of the hand or hierothesia rather than hierotonia. Uh, the ton part of that hierotonia means to impose, to hold the hands on them. Whereas the thesia just is a placing of the hand. Um, it's also important to know that when the bishop ordains, he puts his omophorion, which is a unique Episcopal vestment, over the head of the ordinand, and then he imposes hands on top of that. Whereas when there's a placement of hand, he does not um, place the uh, uh, omophorion over the head of the uh, reader or subdeacon to be, but only places his hand on him and not for a long time. Thank you, Father. The, the other yeah. thing about the, the word tantra, so the, the only reason I, I guess, I don't know, I liked it, but is, is it represents like, of a, like a cutting away, and then in the actual ceremony in the Western Rite, you know, they, they actually cut your hair like in three places, and that's, and I just like the idea of it, that you're being set apart uh, as a, yes. as the installed, I just want to make sure, because, you know, with the Western Rite and Eastern Rite, I want to make sure I, I have a real, clean, that it's orthodoxy regardless, but I want to, from my, I guess, my point of view, make sure that the, the language is important in how we use it and that okay. it's the same thing. So, okay. So once I had a discussion with Metropolitan Joseph about this, um, because I proposed to him a good man and I asked him to make him a subdeacon. 
And he said, has he been made a reader? And I said, no, uh, that's not his gift. He serves in the altar as an effective layman and he has the gifts of a subdeacon. And he said, okay. And so he went ahead and made him a subdeacon. He was nothing before and then made a subdeacon. Uh, when we take a layman who has um, um, the uh, aspiration to become a deacon, we don't make him a reader first. We just um, set him apart as a subdeacon um, and then ordain him as a deacon. Only subdeacons are ordained to the diaconate in our tradition. And uh, so some people have this idea of like, first you have to become a reader, then you can become a subdeacon and so on. But that's not necessarily the case. Another way to think about the orders, uh, this is just me. So it's a theologumenon. It's not um, enshrined in any um, ecumenical synod, but I found it very interesting. You might find some help in it. The reader makes a lot of noise, right? He reads and sometimes chants. Uh, what's the next step? Subdeacon. He makes no noise. As a matter of fact, the less he talks, the better. Uh, then, for you subdeacons out there, you're all. Thank you laughing. very much, Father. <laughs> <laughs> especially from a guy that's all the time yeah. talking but but, but <laughs> it's know, but it's true yes and you subdeacons when you get to talk you don't it's hard to shut you up like during exactly. the coffee time after the liturgy and so on <laughs> okay then what's above a subdeacon is a deacon he makes a lot of noise right he's uh exclaiming this um prompting that and saying all the litanies uh, then the next step after that is presbyter, and uh, it's clear what the presbyter um, does when the bishop is present. You don't hear anything out of the presbyter, just a few words here and there. And then by the time you get to bishop, he's making noise again. Um, although from the Episcopal point of view, uh, St. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch says the silence of the bishop is thunder. So uh, whether the bishop is talking or not, he's always making noise. So there's my little short take on the ranks and their relationship to um, the vocalization of our faith. Amen, Father. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lyle, is that you again, or it just didn't take? Yeah, it was just me down. saying it, amen, and I'm going to shut up if I can. Okay, you. take your hand down then. Okay, and. Um, Anything else on imposition of hands and its related? Are you clear on the material that I talked about uh, primacy and, and the synodality of the bishops? Don't ignore that. Um, yeah, so Father, on, yeah. on, this, on this particular point, because a couple of times you said don't ignore it, but uh, the only kind of couple points I could get out of it is that uh, they rule by synod, and the, the, primer, the primary uh, or the ruling archbishop or the patriarch in our case is the one who proclaims the synod decision and presides over the meeting. Is there, is there more to it than that? Uh, Subdeacon Marwan, you've expressed it almost perfectly. The reason I say almost is because I would like to make it clear that uh, the Orthodox Church, the Catholicity of the Church is expressed in every local church. Um, not only the great patriarchates, but the provinces of the patriarchates. For example, in North America, we have a metropolitan archbishop. When he's surrounded by his um, auxiliaries, um, he presides on his own authority under Christ. And uh, so he is a primate, to use the, the technical term in orthodox ecclesiastical um, uh, theology. Um, I'm not speaking about zoology here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he, he is uh, exercising primacy. Now, he himself is a member of a synod, and this is Subdeacon Marwan, this is, might be what you were thinking of. Uh -huh. He himself is a member of the Holy Synod of the Church of Antioch, and the presiding bishop of that synod is our patriarch. However, the patriarch does not have a jurisdiction in North America. 
uh, I think that's very important to stress. We are not papists. Um, the, primat the primatial bishop, the archbishop of a synod exercises uh, ecclesiastical authority in his territory. In the great churches, such as Antioch, um, we have several territories and uh, that's divided up into metropolitanates. That's why our archbishop is called a metropolitan. So he's, yeah. anyway, I can say more about that, but um, I think that's enough to get us along the way. I think, the, I think when I pose these questions, I'm looking very quickly through my draft exam to see if I, um, Okay, uh, so when a bishop is ordained, when a bishop is ordained, do we add to the episcopate of the church? In other words, is the I'm episcopate of the church, no. No. to use the language of philosophy, uh, is it divisible? And which means when we ordain a bishop, did we increase the episcopate of the, of the church? No. No. no, we did not. So the division, the episcopate is not divisible. Every bishop participates and I, uh, uh, portrays or iconizes the one episcopate of Jesus Christ. Um, as Cyprian of Carthage said that the episcopatum solidum est. The episcopate is solid. It's a block. And it's not dividable, it's not divisible. And that's why every bishop, in, when he's in the loge in the nave of the church, is an icon of Christ enthroned behind him. And you'll see that Metropolitan Joseph, whenever he comes into a church, he always venerates that icon before he takes his stand in front of it. Because he's the personal um, expression of the one bishop jesus christ this is what saint ignatius of antioch taught and we've kept that antiochian ignatian uh view of the episcopate uh intact over all these two thousand years so primacy is simply presidential epis it's just the bishop acting as president of his synod he cannot act without his fellow bishops his brother bishops in synod that's the synodality of the church, or you might say the collegial or fraternal authority of the church. Um, and the church must have a primate or must have a protos bishop who speaks in behalf of the synod. All right, th that's the only point that I think if you have that down, you have what you need for the bishops, at least for the uh, uh, purpose of this course. Thank you very much, Father. This, this is helpful, a lot of help. Thank you. Good. Okay, so let's move on to confession. No questions regarding confession. Well, I have a question for you. Um, is it canonically required that a bishop, I'm sorry, is it canonically or normatively required that a, that a priest or bishop um, extend the absolution to everyone that comes to him? Mm. No. 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 What, is, uh, what did our Lord say when he ordained the holy apostles? Whatever you loose on earth, whatever you loose in heaven is loose on earth. Whatever you bind in heaven is Right. Whatever we have examples of both of these in the Acts of the Apostles. St. Peter, he, he, didn't, he did not uh, give absolution to the uh, one who um, sold, wanted to get the Holy Spirit and sell it. Um, he bound that, that sin, and that man was struck. Um, and uh, Paul uh, did not uh, absolve the man who committed incest in the church of Corinth. And he actually had the church of Corinth act in accordance with his apostolic decision not to absolve him. 
and he withheld the absolution until he repented. Now he did repent. And in second Corinthians, you hear him saying, receive him back as a brother. It's a beautiful end to that very tough situation. So pastors, uh, I should say father confessors, not every priest is even a confessor. I, I wonder if I made that point in that lecture uh, in our tradition. Um, so the priests that become father confessors, when they uh, exercise the authority given them by their uh, ordination to absolve them, uh, absolve those who have sinned, they must be sure that they're giving proper uh, canonical uh, treatment or therapy to, so that the penitent is properly disposed toward amendment of life. This is a very serious matter. Unfortunately, many priests are very uh, loath to take this step because they feel very insecure about whether they're giving proper advice or not. Uh, something that every priest is, uh, takes his pastoral role seriously works hard at to try to um, improve himself. So he has something meaningful to treat uh, those who are coming with various ailments, especially those in our day and age who are addicted uh, to one a form of uh, passion or another, and they find themselves constantly falling. This is a huge pastoral issue, it requires much, much wisdom on the part of, on the, part of the priest. Uh, Father, two questions, yeah. if I may. Yes. Uh, first question is, uh, are there guidelines uh, given to the priest, say, by, uh, by the primate as to when he should, when he can uh, deny uh, someone absolution? Or, or is that up to the priest's the discretion? Yes, this is a very good question. I can answer it quite simply by saying, uh, that if, if you haven't gotten it, you should get a hold of the copy of the Exomologitarium or the confessional manual um, that I've put on the reading list. I know it's been out of print. Um, I understand that it's been online. Um, there's various ways you can access it. It's extremely valuable. Uh, for those of you that aspire to the priesthood or are already priests and you want to improve your... Um, pastoral work by being a good confessor, you couldn't do better than to spend time with that book. It's very well organized. It's a good uh, expression of the canonical tradition, especially the penitential canons. Um, uh, they can't be taken literally, I hope you know that. Um, uh, like for example, um, you know, like so many years out of communion for various serious sins like adultery or, uh, murder or whatever, um, and then everything down from there. Uh, uh, I'll just give you a very common uh, example uh, for self-abuse, uh, like um, masturbation. Um, there's there's uh, various things written in the church tradition about this, um, and there's various um, remedies that the confessor can bring to help uh, the men or women who are caught up in this passionate activity to get them to um, to bring them to the place where they're they're uh, able to fight that battle. Um, but we don't we don't uh, keep them from communion for the full extent of the ancient uh, canonical period, uh, like putting them 40 days on bread and water uh, with no communion. Uh, that would be a killer for uh, uh, almost everybody in our society nowadays who have been catechized to love pleasure, physical pleasure. I'm making a very uh, bold uh, example here because it's very common in confession and uh, priests who deal with this usually kind of scratch their head and say like, what do I do with this person this, uh, or these people, you know, uh, or myself for that matter, you know. Uh, the very big problem. Uh, so we have, and that could be expressed in other um, uh, addictive behaviors that our modern society is rife with because of its technological um, intensity and the lack of, um, of a properly organized, a humane way of life, uh, such as was uh, long standing for thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution. 
uh, there's just a host of problems I could bring up here. We could have a whole course just on confession and the spiritual remedies that could be um, explored. For our purposes here in this course, I would just say that the conditions for confession and absolution are the following. Um, that the person who's coming to confess examines themselves ahead of time and takes seriously making their confession, that they make a thorough confession that is with no self-justification and no politics, and that they express compunction and contrition, that they're very sorrowful over their sins and truly desire to want to amend their life that they promise to uh, receive and obey whatever um, penance or direction that the confessor gives them, and that they make a resolution to struggle against sinning again. Uh, these are the five elements. I gave them in the lecture. Um, and um, actually I gave them when we touched on it at our opening lecture in the residence and also in my lecture when I talked on the sacrament, uh, when we passed over that material a couple of weeks ago. All right, anything else on confession? Uh, one last question, please. Yes. Uh, you said not every priest is a confessor and uh, I, I'm confused by that. When, when does a priest become a confessor? All right, so when the bishop ordains a priest, he clothes him with uh, five vestments. The sticarium, that's the baptismal robe. Mm -hmm. The um, epitrachelium, which is the priestly, the uniquely priestly garment that he uses whenever he's acting like a priest. Okay. Uh, liturgically. Then the zoni or the belt. Then the uh, maniples or the epimanikia over the right and the hand wrist. And then the fifth one is the philonion, which is the uh, festal garment that uh, the priest dons, uh, the cape, philonion. Yeah. There is another, there's another, um, there are uh, ophicia or uh, dignities which are added to the priest. The, uh, so the one is the, um, epigonation, which is a diamond shaped vestment that he wears on his right thigh. And that's a sign that he's a spiritual father. And that's usually our metropolitan gives it after he's made a priest, he lets him live for a while, getting used to being a priest and then prepares him to become a father confessor. Um, and then he grants him the epigonation. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else? Okay, prayer oil. Is it clear to you that this sacrament is not celebrated as often as it possibly could be because of its extreme length? And so it's very hard for the priest to pull this off. And is it clear to you that I taught that in the uh, proper uh, understanding of the tradition we've received, it is not necessary to, it is not re absolutely required that the whole uh, prayer oil service be said in its entirety and that it can be greatly abbreviated. Um, this is mentioned in our tradition, especially in these latter days when we can't easily get seven presbyters together to celebrate the full sacrament. I think I made all of these points clear in my notes, but I just wanted to re, uh, restate that here in our, our review. A very powerful sacrament and it's underused. Of all the sacraments, this is the one that's used uh, the least. And that's a pity because there's so many people that desperately need its benefits. We had a clergy meeting um, at our parish life conference uh, several years ago. And uh, this question came up among our clergy assembled with uh, Metropolitan Joseph. And um, at that time, he made it very clear that he approves of a shortened version of this if it's needed for pastoral purposes. And um, uh, so I'm very glad that he did that because he saw that um, most people find it difficult to serve it 
um, as given, like on Holy Wednesday, unabbreviated, um, and that it can be celebrated more often, especially you can bring the sick together, you can bring people in the community together and say, let's pray for them all, you know, especially those who are suffering greatly. It would be a very, very great blessing for them. All right. Remember, it also had a very long developmental process. It was only fully ordered as we have it now by the 13th century. So <coughs> you have any I, questions I, about this one? Quick question about that one. Yeah, um, just as far as um, location for, say you have somebody who's very ill and can't yeah. make it to the church, can it be, can a truncated service be taken and done in the home? Yes, it can be. For example. Yes, it can be. And there's no problem with this at all. As a matter of fact, the sacrament, as we normally do it in the church, occurs completely in the nave. There's nothing related to the holy, <clears throat> the altar. Uh, the table is set up in the nave with the, uh, with the oil and the wine. And uh, the gospel is brought out to that table. Everything that is needful for that uh, sacrament is uh in is placed in the nave which means it can be done anywhere <clears throat> all right um now the funeral so you heard you heard this uh lecture that i just gave on this so this is fresh on your mind very very complicated manuscript tradition showing the great variety funeral services depending on the status of the person right i think i brought that out in my lecture uh, in my lecture um, um, now <clears throat> we have gone back to the oldest tradition in keeping the funeral service quite simple <clears throat> so we have a service for laity and then we have the funeral service for priests and bishops uh, for clergy. By the way, bishops are, uh, I'm sorry, uh, deacons are, are um, there's not a special funeral service for the deacon. They, they are, uh, the funeral service for laymen is said for the deacon as well. Although the deacon is placed in the uh, beer, the funeral beer, um, with his uh, diaconal vestments. All right. Anything else on the funeral service? Yes, Brad. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. You I had a question about uh, the care of an infant stillborn, for instance, to Orthodox man and woman uh, and their burial. And, and some of this question, I guess, goes even back to uh, last year about the inability to baptize an infant, you know, who suddenly passes away. And, and if you could just elaborate, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I do have some thoughts on this. And uh, uh, OK, so we're all big people here. <clears throat> And I'm going to speak very bluntly about this. First, let me start by a statement that you might find at first to be a little bit troubling, but I think if you think about it, you'll see that there's wisdom in it. Um, we believe that at conception, a human being begins to come into being. I say begins to because it's a process. Um, um, even Basil the Great recognized that in uh, prenatal, like uh, in utero, the, um, the fetus goes through stages and he mentions the first, uh, the formative stage as being the first third of the pregnancy. Basil the Great said this. So there's been always a kind of an understanding that there's been a process involved. Well, I fear that in our current climate, of neo-paganism <clears throat> that in order to ward off the scourge of murdering um, fetuses in utero, um, elective abortion, um, 
not spontaneous abortion, that would be miscarriage, but elective abortion, where it's a willful destruction of what's in the womb. I think in, uh, in, uh, in a kind of a reflex against that, we tend to overstate the status of the fetus in utero from its earliest stages onwards. And we want to somehow legitimize, in the case of a, um, a spontaneous abortion, um, miscarriage or stillbirth, we want to legitimize the humanity of the uh, fetus by giving it the kind of care we would to um, uh, an infant that dies by, by even baptizing it or, uh, or naming it or giving it a funeral. This is very ill-advised. I think, and I've discussed this with uh, Metropolitan Joseph, he agrees with it, uh, but it's a matter that has yet to be addressed in an um, author, you might say an authorit authoritative way by our church because the technology didn't exist uh, in time past. Um, as a matter of fact, we're still in much of our ecclesiastical um, uh, tradition is still acting as though uh, infants that are born are like, likely to die. Uh, the mortality rate you know, of infants used to be uh, much higher than it is now. Um, that's why we have the naming prayer given to a, an infant on the eighth day. Did you know that? It's traditional for us to wait until the eighth day before we give it a name. Um, this emphasizes the process or developmental aspect from conception through the formative stage of the fetus to, you know, it's developing a heartbeat. And we're hearing about all this now because our Supreme Court is rightly, whew, may they be blessed, taking up this question. And hopefully we'll, be, uh, we'll have some relief from this dreadful offering of our children to Moloch, you know. Um, at any rate, um, if, if we were free from that kind of exterior pressure, I think it would be easier to state these things. But I'm afraid it's hard for us now. And so we want to legitimize our humanity by going a little bit too far the other way. Brad, that's what I'm trying to state here. Uh, we do not have a tradition of baptizing um, prenatally. Um, we do not have a tradition of naming a fetus that has uh, you know, met its demise before birth. This is not our tradition. Um, now, it does remain that there's a pastoral uh, indication that we have to care for the woman who, is, who has uh, cast off the, uh, the fetus and not brought it to term. Uh, but if we go too far here, I think we create more problems than we solve. And there can even be the, the uh, promotion of a kind of a morbidity in grief over losing a baby. Um, I hope these comments help kind of flesh out the problem. So does that, does that help? Okay. Yes, thank you. I, I was curious you know, all along that uh, there was even you know, these emergency services for, for baptizing a baby in, in imminent need or where, where all that came from. And I appreciate your, your discussion. Okay, so now what your last point is, I don't want to be misunderstood, that if a baby is born and then dies, as in, like there's an emergency baptism needed because it's, it's not going to survive, well, we definitely want to baptize that baby. It's brought to birth, but it's still alive, even though it may be dying. In that case, we do emergency baptism and nurses are used to that. Those who, who attend births, uh, it, it used to be well understood that nurses would baptize um, babies with water present there um, at uh, like either a midwife would do it or a nurse or somebody attending the birth if it was an emergency. So I don't want to be confused here. Uh, once it's postnatal, then it's a it's a, a a baby that will be named and baptized uh, in an emergency basis. All right. Anything else on that one? 
All right. And the only thing I'll say about prayer to conclude our review is uh, please focus on in my lecture, my difference between charismatic and liturgical prayer and the gift of um, a charismatic prayer needs our effort, our ascetical effort to develop. And if we don't work on that, it remains hidden and undeveloped. Chrism gives the uh, possibility of it. It extends the grace of charismatic prayer, but it remains for us to exercise that grace and to put it into action. Um, I will not be testing you over the material in the, uh, the books that I have asked you to look at. Uh, you've got a choice here, either to go with Sophroni, um, his book on prayer, which is a beautiful work, um, or the um, Art of Prayer, which is a compilation mostly of the work of Theophan the Recluse, along with other um, Athenite fathers, both of them are beautiful works. And uh, I really wanted you to be inspired going forth from this course to add now further work on your own ascesis of prayer and to become a uh, people of prayer, people who keep uh, an interior vigil of your heart and struggle with this with all of your might. Um, it's a God blessed thing to work on developing our prayer and um, not, not uh, flagging on that effort. It's the way that we bring the whole symphony of theology into a very personalized experience of sanctification. Um, as St. John, the theologian says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Okay, what a joy. Now I wish you the best in your um, completion of the final exam and uh, the uh, summing up of the uh, preparation season toward nativity. I wish you and yours a blessed nativity feast. Um, please keep me in your prayers as well. And um, uh, Subdeacon Stephen, you and I must meet for coffee when I come up to Boise um, after nativity. It'll be that soon. Yep. Can this we'll can this come with it? Yes, with her. Okay. B both of you. Yay. All three of all three of us, right? God bless you all. And um, uh, Father Mark Lilligard, would you stay online for just a moment? I'd like to talk to you. Very good. The rest of you may, I'm gonna dismiss you, but I'm gonna stay online with uh, Father Mark there. And um, I will see you all uh, in whatever way the Lord grants us that opportunity. God keep you. Thank you, Abuna. Thank you, Father. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Abuna. Thank you, Father. Christ is born. Glorify. Glorify him. Thank you. And one more dismissal. There we go. Uh, so, Father Mark. Hi, Father.